and I believe we are officially uh, live. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always, within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I am George Kafedzis, a master's graduate from Thomas Euler's lab, and currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again begin uh, by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this uh, ever-expanding and blossoming initiative towards a greener and much more accessible seminar world. Having said that, allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from University of Sheffield, Professor Miko Yu Sola. Following his uh, medical degree from University of Oulu in Finland, Miko obtained his PhD in neurophysiology in 2005, working on neural mechanisms in invertebrate photoreceptors with Martin Wexstrom. He then went to Canada for his first years as a postdoc, first at Alberta and then at Dalhousie, before returning to Europe and Cambridge in 1996, where he started his own lab a year later. Since 2005, he has been located at the University of Sheffield, uh, where nowadays he holds the title of Professor of Systems Neuroscience at the School of Biosciences. But uh, concurrent to this main trajectory, he has been a visiting professor in the Beijing Normal University and a high-end foreign expert selected by the Chinese National Recruitment Program. Throughout the years, and with research interests focusing on uh, sensory processing in Drosophila, Miko and his team have been developing novel experimental and uh, theoretical techniques to elucidate the underlying mechanisms. Uh, recent work of theirs includes uh, discovering how the fly compound dyes uh, exploit image motion to see in hyperacute spatial details, uh, thus bringing together concepts of uh, visual acuity and stereo vision with uh, microsaccadic sampling. Uh, their work advocates for a paradigm shift in terms of how we think of vision in experimental setups, from static eyes with an immobile image to dynamic eyes, dynamic vision of super resolution, active sampling. And thus, I'm very happy to be leaving the stage for him for a talk entitled Seeing the World Through Moving Photoreceptors, Binocular Photomechanical Microsaccades Give the Fruit Fly Hyperacute 3D Vision. So without any further ado from my side, please all welcome Professor Yu Sola. Uh, Miko, the stage is officially all yours. Okay, thank you, George. Uh, very happy to give this talk. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, so I'm going to start uh, now. Let's share the screen. Okay, and let's see if this kicks on. Right, completely wrong position. Let's go up. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, I, I would like to first uh, just discuss a little bit about um, the, the eye and, and um, the theoretical constraints that people have thought about it. Uh, because the exoskeleton of the insects looks really stiff, uh, it, it's been concluded that the, the eye would be static. Uh, so that means that uh, the resolution of the eye is basically based on the, the spacing of the photoreceptors. And the spacing of the photoreceptors, uh, which is the, the crane of the film, is uh, defined by this property called interomaterial angle. So the compound eyes are made out of these kind of little facets, and, and the distances between the facets is this interomaterial angle. Um, I, I will, I hope in the end of this talk, make it clear that this, this idea is very inaccurate and, 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 and the insects actually see massively better than what this uh, static eye prediction gives. There's, there's an image of a, a man with a big eye, compound eye, and this is uh, Kuno Kirschfeld's um, classic illustration where he shows that what would be the size of the human eye if we had compound eyes to have the same acuity as the human small lens eyes now have. There's many things which are wrong in this picture, but I'm not going to spend time on that. Instead, I'm going to go to the another constraint, which is the classic static theory also considers that the photoreceptors, how they collect light, the integration time of the photoreceptors is often estimated by all sorts of impulse functions and impulse responses and, uh, and, and using a classic engineering means. And, and uh, if, if that's so, that if the integration time is slow, then when the eye or the animal moves fast, then these images should blur. And uh, so the idea has been that when, when we collect information from the world, we would do it mostly during when the saccades are still at that fixation phase. And during the saccades, because it's so blurry, we would basically just kill information. Uh, and that, that's also highly inaccurate. Um, so we, we looked into this, um, we published a number of papers. These two are probably the most important. 
And, and the idea is that if, if the nervous system is in a close loop with the world, then and if, if the eye is retinotopically or the brain is retinotopically organized, then you can actually collect images massively fast uh, and um, by, by doing active sampling and then build up uh, by using memory and feedback functions the, the images, the neural images that are massively finer than the, the resolution of the, 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 the static resolution of the eye. And that uh, in, the integration time is, is not really a big problem. So this changes the way how we think the insect visual system works. Uh, so, and it's, it all starts from the sampling. So I will focus quite a lot of sampling on this one, uh, this talk and also processing. Um, I could talk about these other issues, but that would be another talk. Uh, so how good is the insect vision actually? Uh, so there's one way to study is to do intracellular recordings. And this is what we have more or less perfected this technique. So you can make a tiny little hole on the corner of the eye, and, and then you can uh, take a conventional class capillary microelectrode, and you can penetrate through that whole individual photoreceptors, and you can record intracellularly their responses to uh, controlled light stimulus. And, and here is an example where, where um, I'm, I'm presenting a light pattern. It's two seconds long, kind of a thirsty pattern, and I'm repeating it at tens of times. Uh, and then these are the individual responses and, and it goes continuously and this is the light stimulus. Now, when you have a collection of these kind of responses to the same stimulus, you can then estimate how good is the, the responses signal the noise ratio, so how, how well it can replicate that pattern of light. However, it's time when you do these experiments, so you have to consider that you actually damage the eye and the cell without the electrodes, of course, would perform better than with the electrodes. So everything what you get from these kind of estimates, they always underestimates of the true capacity of the, the nervous system or those photoreceptors actually to collect information. Um, so here, because these techniques, I really perfected them, I can keep a, the same cell for hours. And the recording conditions are very stable and the recording noise is as low as you can pretty much go. But of course, it's still not as good as in a real situation would be without the electrode. So I have here a number of stimuli that I was uh, presenting to the, the same fly over and over again. So um, if we go down here, these are all so-called Gaussian white noise. So there's uh, some frequency bandwidth. So here, low frequencies up to 20 Hertz and on here, uh, 500 hertz um, cutoff. So the stimulus is getting basically faster, the modulation. And, and this up ways, you, you, we increase the contrast by, by starting to clip that light background. So we actually have less photons, but we end up in the situation that there are this kind of a bursty uh, positive light contrasts uh, on, on a dark background. And if you look at the responses, you instantly notice that these bursty stimuli, they give massively bigger amplitude modulation than the Gaussian white noise. And also the, the variability of the responses are massively larger. These are not just individual responses. There's actually 20 responses superimposed, but there's so little noise in, in, in actually the nervous system. And I, I think there's a massive uh, um, uh, bias in understanding how, how, how well the evolution has actually tuned this system to operate. Um, so you don't really see much deviations here. So when you calculate the signal to noise ratios for this kind of burst is similar, which is done next. So this is the, the, the one which is having the highest variability for 100 Hertz cut of burst stimulus. Uh, and, and this is a, a classic white noise type of response is what you would use for estimating information capacity. You can see that this white noise is not really, really stimulating or driving the cell very well. So you, you can look at this in a frequency domain. So these are the same responses. This is the 20 Hertz burst stimulus. This is 100 Hertz, and this is 500 Hertz burst stimulus. And, and I, I show in yellow here the, the 100 Hertz because it has the broadest uh, frequency bandwidth. So it is kind of a whitening that energy. But you see the thing of the noise ratios of these responses are massive. So they can in the best cells to go to like 10,000. So there, there's hardly any noise, you know. So the, it's mostly signal, what you see in the real recordings, if you do it really well, if you try to eliminate other noise sources. And, and the, the other interesting thing, what you see is if you look at the probability distribution, so the, the signals are extremely skewed. So there's a burst of light stimulus from a background. So this is far from Gaussian, but when the cell is doing so-called a, a refractory sampling, 
it, it actually allows to generate at the photoreceptor level Gaussian responses to these very skewed inputs. So th this is the input count you see, this is in log scale, so it's massively skewed, but the photoreceptor is producing something which is Gaussian. Uh, and if you increase the, the, the modulation as we do here, then you, you see that it, it's the largest for the bursty stimulus for the 100 hertz bursty pattern. So that, that means that there's a broadening of the Gaussian and there's a whitening of the spectra. And if you have the Gaussian broad spectra and the white in uh, signal to noise ratio, the frequency uh, range, then you go towards the information capacity. So if you calculate then the information capacity, what you find is that this bursty stimulus actually, they are giving you some, in some cases like 850 bits per second, which is very high because the previous estimates in the lit survey around 200, 300 bits per second. So if you give a bursty patterns, which are kind of a typical of what you get in the saccadic sampling, the information rates, they just shoot up from the, the classic Gaussian white noise type of stimulus. So the Gaussian white noise is not really testing these systems very well. Uh, because we, we done lots of modeling on this, we, we can simulate this system also very well. Uh, and this is an example how we've done it. So the photoreceptor, you, you can do this kind of a structure function models. We know that the, the light sensitive part of the photoreceptor, it's called the raptomere, is uh, something that has uh, 30,000 microvilli and each microvilli is a, is a sampling unit or transduction unit. This is a microvilli here. Uh, it has a cascade of reactions and Roger Hardy from Cambridge has really characterized this well. And then this work was done together with Roger. So we. We can now make stochastic models of this sampling. So we can first model an individual microvilli, and then we can model using cluster, computer clusters, about 30,000 of them, and we can model the, the, the photoreceptor soma uh, and its membrane properties by using Hodgkin-Huxley equations. And, and so we can then see, if, because we've done the intracellular recordings uh, and, and, and we have estimated the quantum pump dynamics from those, if we know in different conditions, uh, and I've worked on this a lot in the past, if we know the latency distribution of these quantum pumps, and if we know the amplitude distribution, if we know the refractoriness distribution, and we know the number of microvilli, we need only those four parameters, and we can perfectly predict by using statistics what are the responses. And that's what we've done here. So these models, they don't have any free parameters. Everything's fixed. But you know, it samples like a real cell because it has the structural identity of a real cell, the key parts, what the real cell needs to sample light information. And so when we repeat the, the same pattern, you see the first stimulus are giving the larger, very similar looking responses as what you saw in the intracellular recordings. And when you have the Gaussian white noise, you see these little ripples here. Now we do the same in the frequency domain. So this, okay, this where the, the biggest, the most variable responses for the 100 hertz cutoff. We find that there's the same whitening properties. So you get the widest uh, frequency, the signal to noise ratio for the 100 hertz bursts. And you see that um, the distribution gets Gaussian at the broadest. Um, but the information transfer rates are in about 650. You do get intracellular recordings that give similar type of information transferred as the model, but I, you do also have those higher ones. And so you may ask why it's lacking about 200 bits per second. And the, the again, this is a massively higher than the, the classic. Uh, so these Gaussian white noise, they're pretty much matching with the real recordings. So what is this difference about 200 bits per second? And it actually comes from, uh, because each point in space is more or less sampled by six to seven photoreceptors. And, and that information is pooled in the first synaptic layer in the lamina in, in these cells called the large monopolar cells. And some of these large monopolar cells have feedback connections back to the photoreceptors. So monopolar cell gets information from six photoreceptors plus through cap junctions from eight and seven and eight as well. So it has a higher information content than the photoreceptor and it's feeding some of that information back. And, and we can actually model this as well. Uh, so we get that difference uh, coming from the, the neighboring cells which are feeding back the information to photoreceptors. And, and if you then look at that the individual photoreceptor response, which is shown here in purple. So this is a real recording or in, in wine color. And then, then you have a cray, the, the, what the photos that the model is actually producing. If you put a feedback loop and you, you reduce that difference, the difference actually turns out to be a monopolar cell response, which is here. This is a quite nice way to show that uh, 
the, the monopoly cells are directly feeding into the, and this is a system that the information is going backwards and forwards to be optimized for, for the vision. Okay, so the, there's a lot of detail that one, if one is enthusiastic about it and go and read it in the papers, I'm not gonna go into details, but what, what I just showed to you that the, the experiments in theory, they pretty much define how microbially populations in fly fold receptors encode information. And we've done these models also for Musca and, and Califora and Kiloflies, you name it. And the same principles, as long as you know these quantum pump dynamics and you know how many microvilli, they predict perfectly pretty much what the, what the cells are collecting in terms of information. So the information is captured mostly um, through the high contrast burst and, and it's, it's achieved by, uh, uh, by this refractory sampling and, and the connectivity, these high numbers. So this is kind of an intro. Um, to go a little bit now into a different domain, which is to see if you link the behavior into this. So th this is a fly which has been walking underneath some sort of a plexiglass or, so it couldn't fly off. Uh, and it's these are experiments from by Gerton from Kepfert lab in Göttingen. Uh, and so they were looking at the, the fly behavior from above and then they were identifying those fast movements where the animal was turning rapidly. And these are called saccadic head movements or, or body movements. And if they are over 200 degrees per second, they are called saccades. So these uh, spikelets, which are go up and down, they are the type of saccades that the, the fly is collecting when it's just walking around. What we did next is we, we first, of course, digitized these traces, and, and then we took some images from Google. This is a panoramic from nature. And we collected uh, light intensity patterns from these kind of scenes by using the way how fly is moving in, in the laboratory. Uh, and this is an example. So we had a three types of uh, ways of collecting. One is this following directly what uh, Gerton has done. So you have, uh, there's a, a crosshair which is collecting the intensity differences by using the movement patterns of the fly from that natural scene. But you see that it produces very bursty light intensity time series. And if you do linear walking, so the same intensity values, but it produces a slightly different statistical distribution. And if you then shuffle these values, what we have, uh, it produces, a, again, a different patterning. Now, what I did next was I took these patterns and I was just feeding them to the photoreceptor by using the same recording technique. So interest of light intensity time series pattern. Uh, and then I calculated the rate of information for these different patterns from the voltage responses, interest of the voltage responses that I was collecting. And, and it was clear that if, if, if I was presenting those light intensity patterns that were saccadic, uh, and these are from the same fly one after another, uh, we find out that uh, the saccadic way of collecting information allowed the fly to capture most information from the world. And if we then just use the same model uh, and we use the same patterns, the model replicated these results. So you, you get the highest information rate from the model if it was just getting the light intensity time series as collected by the walking fly. Okay, so we showed that the saccades and the case fixations in natural environment, they actually result in high contrast bursts. And this implies that the eye movements work with refractory sampling to Im improve vision. So all these subsystems from the photoreceptors and the, the, the biochemical reactions, they were tuned by our evolution to their behavior. So they, they seem to kind of a match so that they get a sufficient information content so that they are successful in their life. Okay, so now that was about looking information in, in time, but let's look at it in space. So how fine is the spatial detail that a fly eye can resolve? So to study that, we have built, we have built many, many different types of uh, instruments. This was one of the first ones, uh, so I'm just showing this example. So there's a, a 25 LED endings on this or, uh, light guides, which are designed a closed loop. LED controlled. Uh, so there's 25 LEDs driving light from these light guides, which are put in an array, which can be then moved around the fly. So when I'm recording intracellular, I can then just flip these lights and I can just get the receptive field on that particular sector of the visual field by in one go. But the same system allows also to illuminate two LEDs, which are different distances apart, and then move them across the receptive field with different velocities. They could be also like you have all the LEDs up and you have dark points moving, you can do the same. Uh, and uh, then you can see how well the photoreceptor actually can resolve these moving light dots. 
And uh, what we do for quantifying it, we just use the simple Riley criteria, which is the taking the, the smaller peak in comparison to the throat. Uh, and that gives us the, the relative ratio of how well it could separate these two events. And if it cannot, then you have this kind of continuous line and you don't have a dip there. Um, so you, if, if you can see, you, you have, if you see two dots, you see two humps in your voltage response. If you don't see these two dots, you just have a one continuous voltage response. Okay, so when you do these experiments, we, we used uh, these movements which were quite fast. So this is already saccadic, 205 degrees per second. The dots were, I think in this experiment, 6.8 degrees apart. And then we ran them double fast, uh, 409 degrees per second. This Black curves are the intracellular voltage responses of an individual photoreceptor. Uh, and this blue line is just using the, the classic uh, kernel-based uh, impulse response model uh, and so static model in that sense uh, to, to respond. And you, you can see that it really struggles to resolve those two dots, but the real cells are easily doing it, even when it's very fast. And if you put the light background, it, it, it just gets better. Uh, whereas the, the classic photoreceptor models, they fail. So they, they wouldn't be able to separate those. So, that, so this is the idea of the slower integration time. It, it says that the, the integrating is, is so slow that it cannot resolve them, but then the real cells actually integrates them so fast that they can be resolved quite nicely. Um, and so I, I, I thought about that and I, I did experiments also from different flies, different mutants, for example, histamine mutants where the photoreceptors are not synaptic connected to the network because I thought it might be the lamina network and feedbacks which are helping this resolvability. Uh, however, they, they gave uh, equally good uh, resolvability, those histamine mutants. So I then kind of ran out of ideas. I thought that the only thing that could happen is that the photoreceptors are physically moving. And so I... I drove to Cambridge to see Roger Hardy because he had the high-speed camera system there and we rigged up some flies and we were giving flies some intensity. This is so-called cornea neutralization method where you put a little bit of water on the eye and between the objectives and you can then zoom into these raptomy endings through the lens system. Uh, and then if, if you have a beam splitter, you can stimulate them with the green or blue or whatever light. And if you look at under infrared and infrared light is not stimulating photoreceptors, so you can have the infrared image. And if these lights are making the photoreceptor move, then the photoreceptor movement is seen. And indeed, every single line, this gray line here is when we just flash of light. And you can see the photoreceptors are in its case is responding. And these responses are very big. You know that the, this one raptum is about two microns. So in many cases, this movement is bigger than or, or the size of the width of the raptum here when you are keeping repeating this. So these are directly caused by phototransduction. So Roger has worked out that uh, there is a molecule called PIP2 in the phototransduction cascade. And its heavy end is cleaved from the membrane. It, it's a bit like you are squeezing a balloon. More you squeeze, the more it elongates. And if you release it, it returns back. So these molecules are, the light is causing these molecules to go bounce in and out the membrane. And it makes to, like a squeeze box that the membrane bounds. So it's nothing to do with the muscle. It's, it's happening inside the single photoreceptor. And we can demonstrate that by by just separating the cells. So this is just a one on Matidia. So there's eight photoreceptors. So they are in a battery dish. Uh, and we are just having infrared light and we are just flashing the, the white light or green light or whatever. Uh, and uh, the, the cells are contracting, you see. So there's, there's nothing, you can't see any muscle. There's, it's just coming from the photoreceptors. And, and, and you see there's two components. There's the axial components. So they're elongating and contracting. And, and then there's a, this kind of lateral swinging component, which is kind of waving. The, the cell, cells underneath are from uh, TRP, TRPL mutants, which are completely lacking the transduction channel. So it's not producing an electrical response, but the transduction cascade to that point works fine. So you can see that the PIP2 is able to be activated and inactivated, and it's making these cells bounce over and over again. Okay, so now when you look at this and you understand that these contractions, they are part of the phototransduction, and, and if, if they were not there, the photoreceptors would be blind, then you start to see the picture of how this is really integrated into the, the active vision. Uh, so this is an example, this faster curve of intracellular voltage response, and it's, it's very fast. 
Uh, and, and these are characteristic uh, responses, the, the contractions or these microsaccades that the cell is producing, they are a bit slower, but they're still fast. So you have to collect this with the high speed camera by naked eye, you wouldn't see them. And you can see that the higher the light intensity, then the bigger the response. So they are working like a normal voltage response. You see, you give a big amount of light, you get a big saturated response, little light, you get a pump. So there's the same kind of thing. The movement is really reflecting the, the activation of the phototransduction, but slightly different than the voltage response. Now, if you look at then different light intensities, so this is a massive log scale. So if we have individual uh, photons, they can even make the photoreceptor contract a little bit, and we can separate those. And then when you have a lot of photons, then uh, millions of photons per second, then you get a bigger response. So the, 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 you see the same dynamics, what you, you see in, if you just look at the voltage responses or light current, but they are a bit slow. Now, there's many interesting things. So this is one what we, we use the system. We, we put an extra Piezo element so we could move the fly underneath the microscope. So we could focus basically on the, the lens on the top of the omatidia. And then there are some funny cells. Uh, these are cone of pigment cells that makes a separate aperture that people have not really talked about. And underneath them, there are the photoreceptors, these rhabdomia endings that have some sort of tip links into that aperture. And if you, if you then uh, activate them by light, you see that the, the lens is completely still. And that's no wonder. It has the exoskeleton. There's nothing happening there outside when you're activating. But the photoreceptors are moving very vigorously. The raptomias are moving there. And uh, you see that this uh, aperture is also moving. It's, it's kind of a pendulum swing effect. So this would be where the heavy end of the pendulum is, where it's swinging the largest. And, and here, the the movement is relative to that uh, geometric relationship. So it's, a, it's, it's moving less, but, but the aperture is also clipping light. And we've done other simulations. I'm not going to talk about that. And it, it has a very interesting effect that can also sharpen the light intensity patterns that photoreceptors are collecting. Um, oop. OK, so to the theory. So the classic theory says that the receptive fields are still because the photoreceptors are still. It's a static cell. You have the classic lens. Uh, and uh, the receptive fields, if you do estimation of that by using intracellular electrophysiology, they are from uh, maybe about 7, 8 degrees to about 6, 5 degrees, depending on the cells. And if you have a 6.8 degrees part, two dots which are crossing that receptive field because it is so wide, there's no way that receptive field is going to show those two dips because it is kind of smearing them. So there's no way that the light input as it comes through the optics uh, would be able to ac activate for the transduction so that you had, have two dips. However, if the light comes to the edge of the photoreceptor and the photoreceptor now start to move against or with it, and at the same time contract. So the, lens, the photoreceptor is moving away from the lens. So it's collecting light from a narrow angle. So the receptive field is narrowing. And if you put that dynamic into your models, it predicts that the light input actually turns into these two peaks. And these two peaks can very well try the phototransduction. So you get that little dip there between those two humps. And the photoreceptor is actually able to respond in time, these two dots, even though they're going very, very fast and they're very, very close. And if you do the recordings uh, and, and you see how the recordings and the dynamics, they pretty much uh, match the real cell if you have that dynamic narrowing in your model and narrowing and moving. Uh, and so now what we can do is we can just simulate that how well a photoreceptor could resolve two dots which are very close to each other and they're moving with different velocities by using the stochastic photoreceptor model and plus that new movement model that we have included in it. Uh, and uh, so all these which are in yellow are basically hyperacute. So the interomaterial angle in Drosophila is 4.5 degrees. So it would be a line here. And the old theory would not show any of that. There would be, this would be just single harm things. But the, the simulations based on the, the data uh, of what we collected from the real cells is, is giving them a quite nice responses. And then we, when you do the recordings, you, you do find that the recordings uh, occasionally show the same kind of patterns, which are very similar to what you have in simulation. There's one caveat. At that point, when we were doing this, we didn't understand that the photoreceptor movements are directionally wired. So they move in different directions depending where they are in the eye. So sometimes when we were stimulating, we didn't know 
which way we should be running the stimulus in order to get the maximal responses. But regardless, we were quite certain that it could resolve because some cells, we by chance, we had it in the right movement axis uh, and we got this resolvability, which is matching the simulations. And we do discuss this also in the ELIFE paper when it was published. Now, you, you can, of course, finally then demonstrate that this is true if, if the fly actually can respond to hyperacute patterns. And here we have a striped patterns where the bars are 1.1 or 1.2 degrees apart, and we then rotating it here for the five degrees per second in one direction or the other, this way and that way. And uh, the fly has this tendency of trying to prevent, at least we believe, the slippage of the image. So it tries to follow and the fly cannot now follow because it has a torque meter. So the result, the, the visual field is still because the head is fixed, but however, it still makes the turns in order to follow the light as it turns. And you can see that with these uh, hyperacute patterns, this 1.2 and then 2.9, the fly is perfectly following them. And then when you use the control patterns, uh, they, they are bigger because these are coarser, but still the resolvability is 70% uh, in some cases uh, of for, for these very fine hyperacute patterns. And then the, the responses get smaller if you speed up the stimulus. Okay, so that's that's the stuff that we published in eLife paper. And uh, that, that was in uh, 2017 and, and, and it was all good, but it was mostly looking at individual cells. And we didn't know how this happens across the eyes. So we put a big effort since that to resolve the, 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 the magic of the eye. And I'm gonna talk about that next, but first just summarizing what we have. So we had this microsaccharic sampling. And so this is purely photo transduction, making these cells to contract in certain ways. Uh, and it, this contractions moves the photoreceptor away from the lens or sideways. Uh, and it, when it does that, it is almost like a voice action because it is trying to reduce the the, the light load and the refractoriness in that sense, so it can respond to the next set of lights, um, light changes. And, and you, you can replicate these dynamics with the stochastic model, uh, and it predicts pretty well the, the acuity measurements. And um, the, this whole system seemed to improve the acuity maybe four to 10 times beyond the optical limit. We actually don't know how well it can perform because we have difficulties of making stimulus which is finer than that uh, to test the system. So it was clear to us that Drosophila achieves uh, hyperacute vision by encoding space and time. So, okay, so that's the half part. That's the kind of stuff that we've talked some years now, but now it comes to new stuff, which is far more exciting, I hope. Uh, and so let's get in it. So. I, I went to funeral. My, my old supervisor, Matti Wekstrom, my dear friend, unfortunately, he killed over. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a moving ceremony, but there's, there was other physicists there that I met, and I then started to talk to them after the funeral. That it would be nice to, to somehow use x-rays to see what's happening inside the eyes and, and, and uh, to see the global dynamics of these movements. And they said, hey, we can do it, and you just have to go to synchrotron. And they, they gave me contacts. Um, and there was one guy, Raimund Moxo, who, who, a Swedish physicist who then worked with this with us. And, and, and so we, we wrote the grant application to, to put flies in the synchrotron. And so this is the European synchrotron in Grenoble. And, and here we are, we just put the flies in the tube. We put it into this massive machine. There's Marco, a Finnish physicist, and, and, and then JP, another Finnish guy. There seems to be lots of Finns doing X-ray. Um, uh, who is working uh, in the European synchrotron, and we we put the fly eye there, and we turned the X-ray on, and when we give a small uh, pulses, you can see that the whole eye, the photoreceptors are moving in synchrony. So it turns out that actually you can activate the photoreceptors by X-rays if you have a shit load of uh, photons, high energy photons, even though you you have a very low probability. Uh, sorry, to to activate them. And um, you, you can see them even better if you if you uh, look at the same time on both eyes. So this is a, a nice uh, horizontal cut. So you see the left eye and, and the right eye. And when you turn the X-ray on, if you pay attention here, they, they actually contract here inwards in both. Whoop. Whoop. Uh, and uh, so they move mirror symmetrically. They do opposing movement. 
uh, you can study this, you can build a heat map and you can find out where these movements are fastest and you find out that the, that happens where the photoreceptors are the longest. And that makes of course sense because uh, you have more microvilli there and so you get bigger response. And uh, these are the ones which are in the frontal part of the eye facing forward. Those cold receptors and and these uh, movements are directly intensity dependent. So more X-rays you put, the bigger the movements. And after the just when you've done these experiments, the flies you can repeat the experiments. Um, you can do this for half an hour until they die. Uh, and and if you use dead flies, you can kill them by freezing. For example, using no movement. So this is not heat induced artifact, and we've done all sorts of mutant work to show that this is true. But it's quite interesting because you know the the X-rays. They are 6,000 times shorter than the visible light or the UV pigment sensitivities. So what's going on here? So we, we propose a couple of things that could happen. One is that you just play the game of probabilities. You have billions of uh, high energy X-rays. And even if they have a probability of one in 10 million or 100 million to activate one rhodopsin, you have shit load of them. You can still activate them by, by the numbers. The other option is that uh, the X-rays are, are activating uh, uh, some heavy atoms uh, and, and they like phosphorus uh, and you have a Compton type of effect where there's the individual photons which are being then scattered and those are visible light photons and they are then caught by the, the, the pigments, the UV pigment or the, the green pigment which are in the eye. We, we don't know what is the right answer, but regardless, it, it works. So. We can prove this. So we built a portable electrophysiology. This was done also in uh, uh, European synchrotron, also in DESU, the Deutsche synchrotron in Hamburg. Um, uh, and so we, we put the fly in a tube, we put an electrode there, and this time we just give a light first here to demonstrate you get the classic ERG electroretinogram, you have the on and off transients. And then when you do the X-rays, you get the electrical responses. There's the on transient and off transient, the same way as you see in the real light. Uh, and in addition, you see these movements, uh, and uh, which are shown here. In, in, unfortunately, they are not synced, uh, but they're happening actually in sync. Um, and you see that the higher the X ray intensity, the bigger the movement, and also bigger the electrical response, what you get. Uh, and um, then after the experiment, you can just flash the white light. Uh, and you can see that the electroretinogram is pretty much identical to the one what you had in the beginning of the experiment. So the X-rays had not damaged the eye. Uh, and, and so this allows you now then to work out a bit more about the global dynamics of the photoreceptors. Uh, so, so we had now good evidence, and, and that, that's a big part of the PNAS paper that we, we published to, to look at these mirror symmetric movements and, and, and what it means because we could use X-rays to activate them all at once. But of course, in, in real life, these cells, because of further transduction and where they are pointing, they are each in different phases. So each light little change in the environment is, is selectively activating only a few cells, the cells that are facing to that light source. And uh, you can actually look at this by using a deep pseudopupil microscopy. So we build a new microscope system uh, and we, the, the principle of pseudopupil is well uh, characterized by Franceschini and others. Uh, and and we, we just use the new fancy cameras that are so fast uh, to, to actually look at these dynamics. So the principle is that you focus inside the eye uh, and then you get to the point by way optically, these virtual images of uh, neighboring omatidias, raptomias fused together. So this is about 200 microns from the surface of the eye. And that's a pseudopupil. So you have a non-invasive way of uh, using infrared light, which you can illuminate from the back of the eye and then look at the camera, uh, the pseudopupil pattern and see the pseudopupil pattern moving. So that's a theory. So you can simulate them. So we built a, this kind of computer graphics eye you can do this nowadays, uh, and uh, so you you can uh, you can you can test by optically by simulations that uh, how well the eye is able to move, and you get this principle of uh, superposition, which I'm just spending a little time here. So the omatidia are those lens systems that make up the eye, and inside each omatidium are these uh, eight photoreceptors, and you see the raptomy index. These are the light sensitive parts. And then when you focus in, you get this deep pseudopupil pattern. Um, now, if 
you then uh, stimulate them frontally. So we, we, we built a system by using a beam splitter again. So through the optics of the microscope that we use, stereo microscope, we could uh, stimulate these cells by using a local beam of light. And now by, in these simulations, now we can increase the size of the, the light stimulus itself, the, the uh, spatial size, uh, and see how many photoreceptors in the neighboring mamatidia are being activated by it. And that leads to then the movement of the pseudopupil. Um, so again, there's no muscle here. So there's many, many cells which are not moving. It's, it's only those local cells which are looking at them. And, and because of the curvature of the eye and the screening pigments, which are separating the omatidia optically from each other, then this um, movement is, 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 is local and you can increase the number of cells by increasing the stimulus. So this is just uh, simulating how it is. And it, of course, it also depends on the numerical aperture of the, the microscope that you are using how you get that light into the, the raptomeres. But again, you can simulate. So this is our microscope. We use this Olympus stereo. Uh, and we, we had the numerical aperture of 0.11. So our stimulus, where we were stimulated through the eyepieces, was about uh, 12.6 degrees. OK, so this is the system we built. So we have a microscope. There's the, the fly. Uh, it's in the tube. And you can move it. So it's a coniometric uh, stepping motor-based system. So Yoni, Yoni, sorry, who is it here? The little face here. He, he built this system. Uh, and uh, there's the fly in the tube. Yoni also made this video, so he's a really clever boy. So um, there we have the infrared light. So that goes through the head of the fly. And we can then look at these movements when we give a light flash. And th this is what you see actually in a real real recording. So the microscope allows us to see the direction to which these individual photoreceptors in different parts of the eye are contracting laterally. So which way they are moving. Uh, and you can also see when you carry on doing this that there is a stereo vision. So the two eyes are simultaneously uh, responding when you get to the center of the eye. I'm going to go a bit further here because this video is so terribly long and I got the next one. So this is what you get in the end, is a map of the photoreceptors across the eyes, which way they are moving when they are being activated by light. And uh, the, in the next on the right is a histamine mutant where there's no connections between the photoreceptors and the, and the cells underneath because there's no transmitter to convey this information further. And you see that these movements are identical in, in Different, different flies and different mutants. So it is already a property of the eye itself. And in, indeed it is, and, and we can show it. So we can, we can do the mapping of the stereo range. So this is using the same system. So we can see in which part of the eye, the both eyes are responding to light. So we get this kind of a stereo receptive field and it's about 30 degrees in width. We also can map the, the organization of the raptomere. So they, curve around the eye and then form this kind of diamond pattern. And it turns out that the photoreceptors, when they are contracting, which is shown here, so they go, there's a fast phase and slow phase, which is just moving here. And if the photoreceptors are moving along this R1, R2, R3 axis everywhere, then you, you get this patterning. And that's indeed what happens. So that means that the, during development, there is an anchoring which sets these cells, their curvatures, how, how they, the, the raptomeres are moving around in this diamond pattern, and then allows the fly to move laterally when it contracts in a certain directions only. And so there are ways of doing, we can do simulations and we can combine them with simulations. We can look at this movement. So, so this is just showing that each time when the photoreceptor is moving, it is actual movement. So it's moving away from the lens, which is shown here. And you can actually, measure this directly from the videos because when the op when the raptomeres move away from the from the lens they actually get dimmer so you see the intensity drop directly which is in the same phase as is the lateral movement so they both happen at the same time and you can also look at this movement so i'm asking here what do the photoreceptors what the micro saccades do so they they actually because they are part of the phototransduction they they are not reflex like contractions they are 
they are more for dynamic active sampling. And here we just use the same system, but giving this time a different patterns. So sinusoidal uh, light adapted patterns. And you can see that how dynamically they are responding. And those responses are different depending on the light history, how they have experienced. So we have a, a, this, uh, speeding up sin sinusoid. And if we use the square wave, then the responses are bigger. Um, and then we can just use a uh, just a normal contrast pulses of different types, and um, they give you big responses. So again, I, I really have to emphasize this, this: these are not just reflex like some silly things. They are really reflection of the active sampling, and which is completely continuously tuning into the existing light conditions, and they are responding uh, to the positive contrast, so light increments in moving one way, and negative contrast, to light decrements going moving the other way, but a bit slower. So there's two phases: there's a fast and slow phase, and this rippling happens across the eye all the time underneath that homotidial. Uh, hard uh, outer surface. So now what it means is we now know the directions of these microsaccades, and we can then see what happens if it flies in different positions in respect to the optic flow field when it's flying. Uh, and it turns out that uh, it, it actually helps fly, I'm gonna stop here, to resolve patterns differently. So the when you are flying, the things from the earth are whooshing by faster. Uh, and so the fast phase, of these are tuned into the things that are happening underneath. And then the skyline with the clouds are moving slower uh, and the slow phase is turned, tuned into those really identically, or ideally when the fly is in its normal flight position. And also when it light, fly does a rotation because of the mirrors and mirrors and microsaccades, you know, it enhances the contrast of these two eye signals that are coming in. So you get these two phases. Uh, uh, and so there's many type of ways it can enhance the the the, the photoreceptor responses and beyond uh, beyond in the in the synaptic signaling. So the integration time of the photoreceptors, because it's a dynamic sampling, active sampling, is not playing that big role anymore. So next thing we can ask that is these saccades doing anything for the neural processing? And this is Kavan. So Kavan uh, was building on this uh, two photon imaging system and then particularly looking at the different stimulus. So we have a fly moving on a pole and we are looking at the monopolar cells in this time l2 monopolar cells which are mostly responding to dark patterns so they give a bigger response to that and we use the same type of stimulus that's getting faster and faster and and, and, and finer and finer to see what is the real resolvability so this is just demonstrating how the information is coming from those uh, eight photoreceptors to individual monopolar cell and that the photoreceptors are actually moving certain ways for the given stimulus uh, and then we are predicting that this would give us an orientation sensitivity and hyperacuity in the monopolar cell responses. And this is how we test it. So we have an orientation which is moving now from right to left. And the resolvability is there where we can see that it's bigger changes, again, right leg criteria over the noise that we see in the GCAMP uh, 6F fast calcium dye. Uh, and when we change the orientation of the stimulus, uh, the resolvability is getting better as our theory would predict. And uh, then you will see that when it gets, this particular cell is really favoring the, the vertical stimulus, which we are getting soon there. Uh, and you can see that uh, how much, uh, how much better the resolvability is there. Uh, and now we go to the, the vertical uh, and it all of a sudden goes, Whee! look at that. So um, it, it it's the receptive fields, if, if it was a static eye, you know, this would be just a ring rounds. They would be having the same resolvability in all directions. But you see the monopolar cells are tuned and these, these receptive field orientation axes, they actually matches the, the photoreceptor movement axes. Uh, so we, we map that as well and together. And you can see that when you go from one terminal to another, this map is moving as predicted by the photoreceptor inputs, which are moving. So, so this then leads to the theory of hyperacute 3D sampling in time. So the classic old theory says that uh, those cells which would be sharing the frontal receptive fields, left and right eye, would be perfectly matched, the receptive fields, and there would be no photoreceptor movement. So when there's a stimulus coming, you would get basically two identical responses from the left and eye, right eye corresponding photoreceptors. So you could not really use that working 
uh, what is the depth of the stimulus. However, what we show here is that uh, one set of the cells are moving with the stimulus and other set of the cells are moving against. Again, you have to re remember that there's a lens which is like a lever, so it inverts the motion. Uh, and so that means that the photoreceptor inputs, they look basically different, depending if it's left or right eye and depending which way the motion is going when there's two peaks. And what we were speculating that these basic time differences would be good enough for the fly to work out what's the distance of the object. And how do we do that? So what we did was we, we used so-called Fourier transform beam propagation method. So we took those photoreceptors that you can see that they are different sizes. So this is just a classic uh, raptomeres from one Amatidi. And you see the R1 and R6 are always bigger than R2s and 3s and, and 4s and 7 and 8s are in the center. And because this is not symmetric pattern, you will not have a perfect neural superposition because it would only happen if this were like a flower pattern. So everything would be the same distance away from the center. Uh, and because the left and right eye are mirror symmetric on their organization and how the raptomeres are arranged there, then these all together mean that when the individual cell is collecting or the individual omatidia is collecting information using these photoreceptors, uh, the pickup pattern in the, in the visual space or the receptive fields as predicted by the, the optic light guide properties of the cells, they, they are not going to one dot, but you know they, they make this kind of rhomboid pattern. And, and so that means that when you actually collect information through two eyes, uh, the images, how they are superimposed uh, from left and right eye, they don't make clear pixels which would be the old theory, but they are over completely mapping the whole visual field. And that mapping is different depending what's the distance what you are away from the eyes. And so these are the stereo fields, so they, they vary. And uh, so the classic theory says that, okay, here we have David Beckham. By the way, we have a copyright for that image. So Kevin asked uh, the photographer and, and he said, yes, you can use it. So we don't do anything illegal here. So the, here's David. Uh, and if we were having this four and a half degree sampling matrix by the, the omatidia and the intro omatidia angle being that four and a half, uh, if you superimpose how David would be collected, David would be very blurry. You couldn't really tell that if this is David or Mikko, somebody. Uh, and so we think this is all rubbish. And instead what happens is that um, the photoreceptors, this is the real dynamics when we are simulating them over the matrix. So they are, they are moving as, as with the stimulus. When the stimulus get the receptive fields, they start to move either with or against, and they are at the same time narrowing. And we have now pretty much proven that this is true. We haven't published this, so I'm not going to talk too much about this, but this is quite exciting, so I'm going to show you. So we used artificial neural networks, or okay, Kevin did this. Uh, and uh, what we've done is that we... We look at the real connectome, which was published by Rivera Alba uh, a few years ago. And, and so we, we put that structure into the RNN. And um, then we took the real photoreceptor movements. You saw that matrix, how it's happening. So we had three cases. We either had a static eye, the first model. So we have ANN or RNN and uh, the photoreceptors are not moving. Or then we have just one photoreceptor feeding all these cells and, and moving, or then we have the real dynamics of all this together. And here's the pattern. So we do the calcium signals, and this is what you see, and you can see that it can follow to hyperacute range. If you have static eye, everything else is normal, but it cannot produce any hyperacute. If you have a one uh, photoreceptor feeding it, it cannot produce a bit better. But if you have the real dynamics of the real cells, it gets the same phases. It gets the, the same kind of resolvability. These others, they are phase lacking because these movements are actually doing predictive coding. They are making the stimulus or the, the, the neural response actually lock on to the stimulus as they're moving along. So you, you really have to put everything there is that evolution has thrown at you. You have to have the stochastic sampling. It has to be arranged the right way across the eyes. You have to have the real connectome. And if you do that, you can predict pretty much bang on how the network is working and its sensitivity. And that's what we've done here. There's massively much more on this, but I'm not gonna talk about it because we haven't published it. Okay, so what we showed is that if we have a static eye, it fails, it cannot have hyperacuity. If we have uh, real data, it does have, and if we have the realistic microsecond, it pretty much replicates the real data. 
And now we can go to how this works in a dynamic sense. So we have these two receptive fields. We look at the R6 from the left and right eye. There's an object which is about six, five centimeters away, this uh, white line, and we are just using this white line to cross these receptive fields. Uh, and that's how they move. And uh, that gives the phase differences of those inputs which are feeding into the lamina and into the fly brain. And uh, if you have a, a correlated model, so if you have two photoreceptors, left and right eye, which are looking at the same point in space, and another one which is their neighbor, if you that this is you need this extra cell to do the normalization of the, the signal. Uh, you you can directly translate the distance uh, in space to distance in neural time. And when you do that, you can predict what is the stereoscopic range of a fly. And it turns out to be that it's less than a millimeter to about 10 centimeters and the fly is seeing perfectly stereo, then it gets more difficult. So we can test this by behavior. So we, we have a, a hyperacute pin here against a black dot. They have the same base. So this is actually the this dot and the pin, but if you look at sideways and if you have a monocular vision, they would look the same. But if you just tilt a little bit, you can see that the center one actually is a pin. Uh, and so the fly is free to fly and controls this panoramic arena. It can look at whatever it wants and we are just testing its salience, which one it finds more interesting. So it has uh, three things to choose from. Uh, and we are hoping that when we put it in different positions that it would select the pin because it's more interesting. And indeed, when you do this in, in many flies, and you, this is one, one fly and we, we test it always, all these three options, the control and the different pin positions. Uh, and we've done it in, 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 in 20 flies and the stats are very clear. The flies find these hyperacute patterns more interesting when they are three dimensional and it focuses on them. We can also put a hyperacute dot and hide it among uh, hyperacute stripes and it finds them. Uh, we can put it in different locations and it always finds them and we can test it in controls and it finds it's not interesting. I, I just realized my talk is getting very long, but we are almost in the end. Um, then we can do this by, by learning experiments. We can teach the, the classic T university that Heisenberg has, has shown the work very well and the fly can resolve or avoid if it's linked with the heat, whether it's a T or inverse T or vice versa. So the learning index is there. But we can also have stripes which are hyperacute and we can hide the three-dimensional pin and it learns very well. Or we can have just the dots and pins on different types. This is just the one variety we be learned, tested and they all learn. On the other hand, if we, uh, if we paint one eye black, the fly doesn't learn anything for these hyperacute patterns, but it does learn these coarse T inverse T patterns. And this is consistent with what Tang and Heisenberg showed that there's a, a visual invariance in the eye. So if you learn something on the left eye, you can also t uh, test it on the right eye. Uh, and so big patterns, which doesn't require stereo vision, it, it still learns. But if you need some small patterns, which require stereo vision, it cannot learn. And then of course we have controls of all sorts of blind versions um, flies that shows that this is nothing to do with any other stimulus. But most beautifully, we, we by accident, because we want to test how the R1 to six, which are these other photoreceptors, and R7 and eight, we, how much they are contributing to stereo vision. We found out that uh, if we had these NORP A, uh, these are blind flies, and we only rescued those other photoreceptors, something goes wrong in a small percentage of flies. And, and in those flies, we get electrical responses of both eyes, but somehow the anchoring uh, of the one eye is not showing lateral microsaccades. So we did uh, imaging by this uh, pseudopupil method and we did electro uh, retinograms at the same, and then the behavior from the same flies. And it was a massive Herculean task by Ben and, and Yoni, but we, we could show clearly that if the microsaccades were not synchronized, the fly was not able to learn. It was not able to see those uh, stereo patterns. And it was not able to see either a T inverse T patterns. Uh, and we also showed that you, you can also learn uh, if you use only the center photoreceptors. You just, uh, you learn better if you have both working, but both are contributing into stereo vision, both R7 and 8 and R1 to 6. Uh, and then finally, we showed that this old uh, classic uh, belief that uh, there would be a spatial aliasing, that if you have a double the interromatidial uh, angle somewhere like seven degrees pattern in terms of waveform that you have this optimal reversal. Uh, but we, what we found out is that this optimal reversal comes actually 
from a perceptual aliasing, and that the, the, these hyperacute patterns here, they, they are stronger if the, we use a small cup where these are closer to the IS and what theory predicted. And so they are still uh, giving good responses to hyperacute patterns in a big cup, but they, they are not seeing this as well because the, the ability to resolve 3D decays with distance. And then we tested this uh, by painting one eye black. And when you paint one eye black, then actually with this uh, same six to seven degree patterns, you don't get any optimal reversal. So it is the competition between the two eyes when, when they see it. And it is also depending on the velocity. So you don't see any aliasing if you have a fast patterns, uh, but you see only this reversal when you have a slow patterns. And it turns out that this 45 degrees, 50 degrees per second is actually the same velocity as, as the velocity of the microsaccades. So in one eye, they are completely locked into the stimulus and the other eye goes against them doubling. So the eye which is locked to the moving stimulus, of course, don't see anything because it moves with them. The other one sees the contrast. So it thinks that the world spins the other way around. And so you get this illusion that you can actually explain by the microsaccadic mirror symmetric sampling now. You don't need the spatial aliasing. Actually, we know that spatial aliasing cannot have any effect because of the ripple of the effect of this and, and the organization of the raptomeres being not symmetric. So there's no way of you could have a aliasing effect there in spatially and, and it's actually a behavioral thing. And we can prove it by, by using different velocities. So you see here with the higher velocities, it works normally and, and in lower velocities not. And then when we uh, paint the eye black, one eye, then you never get the spatial aliasing. Um, so I'll stop here. This was the peak message. So the microsaccharic sampling photoreceptors contract to light. And it's already at the level of sampling that defines the stereo vision or the abilities of stereo vision, at least in, in these insects. Uh, and that the uh, refractory sampling, I, I didn't really make a big case of this, but you just have to trust me. It is very important in improving the temporal resolution of the signals. And it's together with the microsaccade and that refractory sampling that really gives these uh, cells and the, the ability to to resolve uh, things in hyperacute 3D. And that's it, that's the team. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Miko, for this uh, very interesting and entertaining uh, talk. Uh, I'm going ahead and posting the Zoom Room link in the chat already. There are a couple of questions appearing, but I would like to remind to our audience that they can either ask there or join us already in the room uh, to ask directly. Uh, before I go, on with the questions that uh, are already in the chat. Uh, I really enjoyed how you go from ex vivo to in vivo to x-rays to behavioral to all sorts of modeling from numerical to neural networks. Uh, and the first question that appears is from uh, Sam Budov, who says, very cool work. Can you please elaborate on how movement was integrated into the recurrent neural network? Yes, so we you, you saw those uh, movement uh, receptive fields. This is the, exactly the same dynamic. So we, we put it as in the sampling matrix, which was then feeding the, the network. And then it was then looped. So we were minimizing the error between the, the, the you have the connectome and the movements and, and then the calcium signals. Uh, and, and then this was taught, we, we, the training was happening by massive data sets, uh, what Kevin has collected. And, uh, and uh, um, so that's all I'm gonna say about it because I don't wanna rain on Kevin's parade, we hope to start working this very soon and then turn it into a paper. And so uh, I don't want to give all the all the fine details that he, he needs to tell himself and get all the glory for it. <laughs> and then the second question from uh, Sam, which is a little bit more extreme, I would say, can you speculate based on your X-ray stimulation results, how this may relate to hallucinations experienced by astronauts? That's a really good question. And some other people have uh, asked this. And I think it's, yeah, this X-ray uh, x ray that you, you experience in the International Space Station or gamma rays, they, they can, I'm pretty sure, activate. There's, there's a studies uh, by, by looking at the X-ray vision um, um, in, in 1950s and, uh, and so by some Americans and, and Russian and, and um, Gregor Pelushi, he, he was pointing these studies to me, and there was evidence really that uh, you you can uh, you you can activate the, the phototransduction in frogs, for example, by just using the X-ray machine. So uh, I, I think this 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 is interesting. Also, we know now there's been a couple of works on the vertebrate vision that the rods and cones they also contract and they have very similar dynamics. So this may be also a way of reducing the the motion blur in the same way as what what happens, although the retina is different. Um, 
So I, I think the evolution is really clever. It, it really goes for like or call, call this a nimble AI comes with tricks how you can you can go over the, the limits of the, the classic optics like a stationary eye by, by just using motion there in, 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 in sampling. Right. Thank you very much for addressing both of them. Uh, as there are no more questions appearing, I will take the advantage of asking some of mine. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I would like to send to tell you that there are a lot of people congratulating you for your talk because you don't have the YouTube uh, okay. tab open yourself. So the much. question I have is like also seeing uh, Kit Longden being in the chat is um, we know that there is like a synergy of uh, color and motion. And we also know that, you know, uh, in the real world, you don't only have like human white or just drosophila white light have you tried like either to model like more of the like not only to stick to the r1 to r6 but also the experiment to try like different lights yes so we, we that's part of the the panas paper so the panas paper has 150 pages long supplement where we we, we use all sorts of mutants to look separately R7s and R8s and different cells and without having different uh, uh, spectral sensitivities. And, and yes, so you get the biggest movements then when you have the most cells activated. So if you, if you have a uh, UV light, it activates all R7s. It also activates all R1 to 6s because they have the sensitizing pigment, the antenna pigment. And so it, that movement is then of course bigger then if you were to use selectively, say some, some blue light or ample light, ample, for example, would be only activating the, the RH3 receptor in the RH cells. And, and so you would see only one cell moving. It, it's very interesting because the, the movement, these, these photoreceptors in Omatidia, they're connected, they're linked. So they are not moving independently. So if, if one is activated, the whole lot moves. Uh, and if, if they all are activated, they all move. And it, it comes to really interesting dynamics. And there's a bit of that in, in the PNAS supplement where we do simulations. And this is also related to that slit effect I thought about, talked about a little bit about the aperture, how it's influencing, how the light beam is actually being collected by this. So this, this, this really leads to some sort of predictive coding by motion and how the, the, the eye is organized by this motion vector axis is how the mirror symmetrically are looking at relating to the most probable way of you moving in the, in the world where many things are vertical. Uh, and so it, 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 it's, uh, and it was clear in, in the cave simulations where we looked at the, the, the calcium signals in, in that the RNN and, and the moving photoreceptors is that they, if you had the moving photoreceptors going all the right dynamics, the, the signal is actually replicating the real. So you don't have phase differences. So if you, if you have one photoreceptor moving or you have still cells, they are lacking. So, so yeah, please, please go on. So, so that, that's, that's quite nice. So the whole system is evolved together to get the benefit. So it's, uh, so th th what, what, what we have been doing and very kind of systematically is really have this kind of a bottom up approach where we build these multi scales models rather than make a big claim that I have this idea, it must be high order. And then we jump onto some cell and we put there some engineering maps and say, oh, there must be this kernel and there must be this static nonlinear and this is what it does because nobody knows. So, so those cells in, in that high order, they're equally clever to photoreceptors. They are all morphodynamic. They, they have a structure which is moving and doing something there in a more complex way that we give them credit for. But what we want to do is we want to kind of a, give them a job, which is what our models or our head tells should be there. But, but yeah, this has been useful, but it, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure in many cases, it doesn't give you the, the absolute image or absolute thing. It also gives you the illusion that the, the eye is killing information, which I often hear people talking about. They said, oh, it uses only the spike zeros and ones. We don't need this information. But you know, the information is, is, is already moving and changing the structure of the cells. It's changing the biochemical cascade. It might not be translated directly into the, the patterns of single, single ones or zeros which are going there. It's constantly making that tissue. It's living, it's like your bicep when you're doing it. So, so, so the, the, the information is not killed in a sense that you are losing information. Uh, there, there may be that the information is distributed in, in a way that is, is, is a kind of a combinatorial and dist uh, distributed in, in, in a complex ways that we don't know yet. So, but so, so honing right. into one cell and giving it a high order function, I think it's dangerous. That's, that's my point. Right, so the question I have like as a follow-up to what you were saying is like, because it looks like there is kind of a, an orchestrate. I know it's not orchestrate, but it looks like all the photo setters are moving towards a single direction, right? Have you tried to set, like uh, to shine light at two different areas of the eye to see if it is actually like driven by a higher 
process or if it is indeed? Well, there, there's, 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 there's few things that we want to do. So, so these, these maps, they're, they're really, we are, we are giving light into different positions of the eye and that location specifically moves the photoreceptor. But not that's simultaneously, the, right? So you're giving light at single areas. Yeah, yeah. We, single, we, we, for, for multiple areas, we, we only can do it so when we have a frontal stimulus. So we have two sets of cells which are doing it simultaneously. So the left and right eye. So they, they, they show the dynamics and they're mirror symmetric. So we know that. But we haven't done an experiment where you, you are looking at one point in the eye and then you stimulate the other. I have to also say that the, what we are not looking at here is the muscle movements. And I'm sure the muscle movements, the, the intraocular eye movements, they are important. They, they have a function. And we, we've looked into this to some degree. The problem is that when you are having a head fixed flies, the flies actually reduces this kind of spontaneous eye muscle activity. They're like, oh, I'm in a straight check. I don't want to do anything. Where, and, and then you only get this kind of low order things. But of course, in the real world, you have the head movements, you have the body movements, you have the intramuscular, inter retinal movement, you have the photoreceptor moves. It, it's a very complex thingy and it works together there. So it's, 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 it's not easy. So, so what we simulated is only data in the head fixed flies, how we see the situation. But it, I'm sure it's different if you have all these degrees of freedom messing about. Right. And like one last question I have from my side, uh, and like I would like to remind to our audience to either join um, the Zoom room link that I'm posting uh, in case they want to keep track of um, what we will be discussing soon uh, or, you know, like we will see them next time, I guess. Uh, so like the question I have is like what I find hard to put together in my mind. So the LMC neurons kind of pull information from different photoreceptors, right? So you say that the photoreceptor output improves and it can detect like these two bumps in the output that comes from the input, but how will the downstream LMC neuron be able to resolve that if both of them move together? Like if two photoreceptors- I, 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 can, I have one slide I prepared. I, I mean, I know this is pretty much too much, but if, if you want to see it, I, I can answer that question. So that's, uh, okay. So, um, I'm just going to go down here. So I, I, uh, We've we done work on uh, Mosca. So one of my PhD student, Neven Manshu, was uh, looking into... You see this now? Uh, not yet. You have to start screen sharing again. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I thought I did, but I didn't. Um, share. Yes, share. Now. Do you see now anything meaningful? Yes, we see the slides. Okay, so uh, there's a couple of things. I first, you know, these microsaccades, they happen in, in we, we looked at them in Muska, in, in housefly, and we look at them in the honeybees, which has opposition eye, and they happen there as well. It, it, they are tuned into the, the, the receptive fields of the cell. So because Muska has such a small interomatile angles, the, the, the microsaccades are massively faster and smaller. So they, they go in the same scale. So this is just a Muska doing it. So in, uh, in case of uh, Drosophila, you remember it's about 100 microseconds, 100 milliseconds, and, and then they were peaking. But the, you know, these guys go in 10 milliseconds, so they're 10 times faster. Uh, and so uh, then when we go to Muska photoreceptors, so here we use the same stimulus that you saw for, the, for Drosophila. Uh, and uh, and you, you see the same thing, but here and they go to 200 Hertz burst. And then you look at the monopolar cells with what you were asking, they go really, really shit fast. Now, if we look at the information rates in the monopolar cells, what you get is like 4,000 bits per second if you have burst stimulus, which is tuned. And, and, and why it does it, so, so this is illustrating what, what is really amazing that hasn't really been looked at in monopolar cells, so hopefully we publish this soonest. But if you look at the photoreceptor patterns to these bursty things, they are these monotonic changes. But you see the, the monopolar cell is, is, is biphasic. It's responding when the response is going up and it's responding when it's going down. So what it effectively does is it does a, a frequency hopping. So when you look at the light stimulus, which is shown here in gray, so this is the signal to noise ratio of the light stimulus, stochastic pattern. Uh, and you see that the signal to noise ratio of the light stimulus goes to zero about 700 Hertz. But the monopolar cell can follow up to 920 Hertz. And it's because it's doubling the frequency, it's doing the frequency hopping. So it's taking the energy of that high, uh, or the, the high reliable low frequency information and it's backing it because it gives the two signals to the same 
pattern, one pattern, you have this kind of a kernel like monotonic response and you get boom, boom, double on that. So you, and these are so, there's no noise, you know, there's hardly any noise when you have stochastic sampling, you know, because the single noise races are so massive. So uh, there's a massive underestimation of the goodness of how good these things are operating. And most of the noise is actually operational or just working or adaptation. Uh, and it, 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 it's not an issue into this. And, and so it, it really does the info max and then uses these kind of things that we really talk about them as, as a nimble AI. So you, you do these tricks and there's, there's other tricks, but this is just the one thing for your question that how, how can it take that information and turn it into time? And it, it, it can. Right. Thank you very much for this uh, clarification, Miko. Uh, I have a lot more questions, but I think it's time for me to waive my moderator rights. So I will be stopping the uh, broadcasting so we can continue here with people that are okay. uh, interested. So thank you very much once again for giving uh, this talk uh, in our series. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you.